Hello there. The title of this session is, Did We Really Need a New Hearing Simulation Standard? Measuring Headphones with the HF Hats Type 5128. My name is Jude Mancilla, and I'm the founder of a website called HeadFi.org. I started HeadFi in 2001, and it's grown into what I believe is still the most popular website focused on premium audio, with our focus more specifically being headphone audio. On HeadFi, we have a very active community of audio enthusiasts who discuss, review, and even measure headphones and other audio gear. When not in the midst of a pandemic, as a community, we also get together in person with privately organized meets and gatherings all over the world. Additionally, HeadFi produces a headphone expo and trade show called CanJam, with seven events internationally, including three in the U.S., two in China, and London and Singapore. And at HeadFi's office here in Michigan, we have a state-of-the-art audio measurement lab, and we spend time discussing and sharing audio measurements, mostly headphone measurements, with headphone industry engineers and product team members almost daily. Now, with the limited time we have, I'd better get right back into the topic of this session, and I'll start by answering the question that the title asks. Did we really need a new hearing simulation standard? And the answer is yes, we definitely did. I'm assuming most or all of you know what a hearing simulator is, but in case this is new to you, here's the definition. Oh, and before I show you the definition of a hearing simulator, know that from here on out, when I say headphones, I mean either headphones that go over or on your ears, or earphones that go in your ears. A hearing simulator is a device which connects the headphone under test to a microphone in such a way that the working load on the headphone is the same as if it was used on a real ear. Furthermore, the ear simulator should be made in such a way that the signal picked up by the microphone as a function of frequency is the same as the sound pressure in the ear canal at the eardrum. Most ear simulators used in our industry are based on an international standard called IEC 60318-4. Because this standard used to be named IEC 711, they're often referred to simply as 711 simulators, and that's what I'll be calling this current standard for the rest of this session, 711. And the 711 ear simulator standard has been in service for nearly 40 years, since 1981. At a previous AES conference, one of the presenters was talking about the 711 standard and how long it's been around, driving home the point by showing us photos of iconic people and things from 1981, which I shall echo now. Here are some people and things from 1981 that I remember fondly, and perhaps these will bring back memories for some of you too. A good number of you probably weren't even born yet. And this is what I looked like in 1981. A lot of years and a lot of orthodontics have passed since then, and it would be over 30 years after this photo was taken that that kid would do his first headphone measurement. Again, the 7-Eleven standard has been in use for nearly 40 years and is so entrenched it will likely remain in use for some time but there are some key limitations with the 711 standard. While they are routinely used to measure headphones from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, which is generally accepted as the human hearing range, 711 simulators are only specified to simulate human hearing from 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz, as you can see in the graphic on the screen now. Now below 100 hertz and above 10 kilohertz, you can use a 711 simulator as an acoustic coupler, but it is not simulating human response in those ranges. This limited range was more than adequate 40 years ago when the focus for this type of test and measurement were often things like hearing aids and telecom devices, but high-resolution devices in the decades since routinely cover and often exceed the range of human hearing. So, to get the full measure of the higher-resolution, more advanced devices of today, we need to be able to model human hearing across its full range. Some of the reasons for 7-Eleven's limitations involve its simplified representation of the part of the human anatomy that it's intended to mimic. To be clear, a 7-Eleven ear simulator is far more intricate than its simple-looking cylindrical exterior would suggest. Far more intricate. Inside of this is a straight representation of a length of ear canal, a microphone for an eardrum, and an elaborate two-branch design with precise side volumes and slits to mimic the human eardrum's energy losses. As intricate as it is, though, again, 7-Eleven is still simplified relative to the human anatomy it mimics. Something else that can lead to measurement uncertainty and inconsistency with 7-Eleven is the variety of 7-Eleven-based measurement fixture configurations available. One of the most popular and simplest configurations involves a simple metal canal extension attached to the 7-Eleven simulator for measurements of insert devices. There are also full 7-Eleven-based mannequin setups by different manufacturers, and configurations in between those that look more human-like than a simple metal canal extension, but not quite as anthropomorphic as the full mannequins. While this flexibility in terms of configurations can be helpful functionally as well as in terms of budget, it can also contribute to seemingly arbitrary variations in measurement results. 
When these inconsistencies rear their heads, it can become quite a challenge trying to correlate the measurement we're looking at with the device as we hear it. And this disparity between a headphone's measurements as we see them versus the headphone's sound as we hear it, that in my opinion is one of the critical issues we face when measuring headphones. So let's look at an example of what I'm talking about. When it comes to correlation between subjective and objective analysis, one example of a headphone I've found to sound quite different from the 7-Eleven measurements of it that I've found online is the Westone W60 Universal Fit Earphone, which is a premium earphone that's been out for quite some time now, for several years. In each earpiece, the Westone W60 uses six balanced armature drivers with a three-way passive crossover. Here are four 7-Eleven measurements of the Westone W60 I found online. Here are those four Westone W60 711 frequency response measurements shown together. Again, I picked the Westone W60 for this example because after having owned and listened to the Westone W60 for some time and then finding measurements of it online, I found it difficult to reconcile the difference between the two. The difference between what I was hearing and the measurements I was seeing. Also, as you can see from these measurements, there are substantial differences between them, despite the fact that all were done on 7-Eleven based measurement fixtures. I believe the first two measurements shown were done using a 7-Eleven simulator with simplified metal ear canal extensions, and the third and fourth ones were done on 7-Eleven based measurement mannequins. If you had not heard the Westone W60 before seeing these measurements, what you see in each of the measurements shown would suggest that above 5 kHz, the Westone W60's tonal balance is largely characterized by the 10 to 18 decibel peak centered at 8 kHz to 10 kHz, as well as that peak's effects through its lower and higher peripheries. This is due to a half-wave resonance of the primary volume of the 7-Eleven simulator. And when measuring headphones, this half-wave resonance will often shift down and appear within the 7-Eleven simulator's specified range of human hearing as it's doing here, effectively narrowing the human simulation range of a 7-Eleven simulator. So the variations in 7-Eleven based measurement fixture configurations, as well as those aspects of the 7-Eleven simulator's acoustics that aren't representative of average adult human hearing, can and often do lead to what we're seeing here. Again, the 7-Eleven standard has been in use for nearly 40 years and will in all likelihood continue on as a standard for the foreseeable future. There's an inertia that comes with that much time and so many 7-Eleven measurement fixtures in use. With time and progress, though, also came the need for a better, more human-like standard. And the 40 years since 7-Eleven's release has seen technological advances that make this possible. Brulin Kerr thought of this many years ago and embarked on a research and development initiative to do just that, to create, from scratch, a more human-like hearing simulation standard. And after a 12-year effort, they announced the Brulin Kerr High Frequency Hats, hat standing for Head and Torso Simulator, type 5128, which I'll just call the 5128 for the rest of this talk. The 5128 was developed to provide, for the first time, a realistic reproduction of the acoustic properties of an average adult human across the full audio range, from 20 Hz to 20 kHz. To characterize human hearing across the full audio band involved two key research phases. First, to determine the average adult human ear canal geometry, and second, to measure and determine the average acoustic impedance. To determine the average ear canal geometry, the researchers used contrast-enhanced MRI scans of more than 40 volunteers, from which 3D representations of ear canal geometry were realized as solid geometric models. Geometry averaging, using the image registration method, was used to determine the mean profile along the length of the canal, resulting in a 3D model of the adult human average ear canal. Here, you can see that geometric average compared to one of the measured subjects. The next step in the process was determining the average acoustic impedance of 32 of the subjects from that MRI study. This phase involved the application of a specially designed impedance probe which required precise positioning in the ear canal. For this, individual earplugs for each subject were molded using extracted geometries from the MRI measurements. The impedance probe itself was created using two probe microphones, one to measure the response and the other adapted to act as a sound source. The resulting data from this study provided a family of impedance curves which were used to arrive at an average acoustic impedance curve. Simply put, with the completion of these research initiatives, they were able to determine both the average adult human ear canal geometry and the corresponding average acoustic impedance. Now it pains me to rather coarsely abbreviate the descriptions of these two phases the way I have, but I had to in the interest of time. The details of these chapters are far more fascinating and complex than I had time to cover here, but I do encourage you to read these associated papers for a deeper dive into the particulars of these works, the most granular bits of which I'm perhaps unqualified to present to you properly anyway. All of this research, this exactingly measured and computed average adult human across the entire hearing range, was made tangible in the Brulin Care 5128. 
If the idea of a simulator is to mimic, simply looking into the ear of the 5128 versus that of a typical 711 configuration makes clear that as ear simulators go, we definitely have an ear simulator. Whereas a 711 simulator's canal is represented by a straight cylinder at the end of which is a half-inch microphone diaphragm parallel to the measurement plane, the 5128's canal is thoroughly more human, with the first bend and second bend and a varying cross-sectional area as you move through it, qualities you'd expect to see in a human ear canal and the standing wave pattern through which is far more complicated than a straight tube with a uniform cross-section. And the 5128's canal even mimics the transition to the harder, bonier condition nearer the eardrum. At the end of the 5128's ear canal, it's terminated with an eardrum assembly with an effective area allocated to constitute the load of the eardrum more accurately, and that canal termination is at an angled orientation that faithfully represents that of a typical human eardrum relative to the ear canal. Again, contrasting that with the 711's microphone diaphragm that's simply parallel to the measurement plane at the end of a straight cylinder. And this brings me to the 5128's eardrum assembly. To realize the acoustic impedance from this latest research required greater resolution than any previous standard. So the 5128 eardrum assembly's acoustic circuitry involves a far more sophisticated four-branch design versus the two-branch 711. And the 5128's coupler design requires essentially no cavity volume in front of the diaphragm. So looking through to the end of the canal, it's very noteworthy, especially if you're used to looking down the straight tube of 711 simulators, it's very noteworthy seeing the 5128's canal terminated so realistically. Speaking of looking through the 5128's ear canal, doing this again really drives home the extent to which the 5128 mimics the human anatomy it's simulating. While one can easily disassemble the 5128's ear assembly to expose the eardrum, if you want to see it clearly through the canal, you need to use an otoscope. Contrast this with any 711 fixture, whether it's using a simple metal canal or a full type 3.3 simulator with a pinna, where the 711 eardrum is quite exposed and easily seen from the outside. At this stage, I think we better get back to looking at measurements again, because after looking at some comparison measurements, 711 and 5128 measurements, we're going to need to circle back to talking about anatomy again, and by now our time is really limited. Let's go back to looking at the West Tone W60 frequency response measurements done on 711 simulators that I found online. Again, despite the fact that all of these measurements were performed on 711 simulators, the results vary greatly. While some sample-to-sample -sample variation could account for some of this, as of course can measurement technique, the magnitude of these differences is, in my estimation, far greater than would likely be encountered by either or both of those factors, as one, I'd expect Westone's premium earphones to be quite reliable and consistent from sample to sample based on my experience with their products, and two, the people who posted these measurements were all experienced earphone measurers. As I mentioned earlier, my subjective impressions of the Westone W60 and the general subjective impressions of the Westone W60 I found in our community discussions on headfi.org do not correlate well with the 711 measurements of this earphone. Measurement 1 and 2 show it as far more bassy than it actually sounds, especially measurement 1, and all have the 711's high magnitude resonance defining much of the treble. Measurements 3 and 4 are showing very recessed energy from 4 kHz to 8 or 9 kHz, and that isn't consistent with subjective impressions either. Here are measurements of the Westone W60 on the 5128, showing the difference between the two types of ear tips that come with the W60. Most measurements seem to be with the silicone ear tips. Here's the 5128 measurement of the W60 compared to the four 711 measurements we've been looking at. And here's the 5128 frequency response measurement compared to the range of those 711 measurements shaded in red. Paying particular attention to the treble range, what you're seeing in the 5128 measurement is the average human response with these earphones as opposed to a measurement artifact caused by a high magnitude resonance of the coupler that's shaping what you're seeing in that range with all the 711 measurements here. Keeping in mind also that 711 is not modeling human response above 10 kHz even by its own specifications, and even narrower depending on the device being tested and or the fixture configuration being used as in this case. In talking to several headphone engineers, the treble range is among the most challenging to understand with measurements alone, and based on our experience with it so far, I expect the 5128 to be an important step in demystifying treble tuning and performance for headphone engineers going forward. Now please also note the difference in the bass and even in the midband, particularly that of the 5128 compared to the 711 measurements, because this brings us back to more specific discussion about ear canals. Ear canals in typical 711 simulator setups and the ear canals of the Brulin Care 5128. 
When measuring some headphones, and perhaps even more commonly when measuring in-ear headphones, what we're seeing in the Westone W60 measurements from the bass into the midband sometimes occurs. That is, when measuring in-ear headphones on 711 simulators, you will often see higher measured bass levels than when measuring the same headphone with the 5128. When I saw this happening, my first suspicion was poor coupling, a poor seal between the earphone and the 5128's ears. With the earphones this was happening with, though, no amount of dismounting and resealing would close the gaps in the bass and mids in those measurements. Two things eventually suggested to me that this was not about a lack of seal or poor fit. First, the plots from the mids to the bass, while separated, ran largely parallel all the way down into the lowest measured frequencies. With the leak, we should expect roll-off as we go lower in frequency, and we were not seeing that. The bass differences ran parallel. Secondly, the 5128 measurements were symmetrical left and right, and a leak would not normally be expected to show up so reliably symmetrical in both ears. So, I brought this up with Brulin Care and found out why this was happening. A typical 711 configuration has an ear canal realized as a 7.5mm by 22mm tube. The equivalent volume of this type of 711 configuration is around 1.26 cubic centimeters. The 5128's ear canal is realized as an average human ear canal around 27 millimeters long. The 5128's equivalent volume is around 1.55 cubic centimeters versus the 711's 1.26 cubic centimeters. Since 711 was established nearly 40 years ago, we've come to better understand the dimensions of the human ear canal all the way to the eardrum using ex vivo cadaver studies, as well as more advanced scanning studies like Brule and Care did with the MRI study. The length range of the adult human ear canal is around 22 millimeters to 31 millimeters. So a 711 is in fact smaller than the average adult human ear canal. Actually, it's closer to the bottom of the range. Please ask me more about this topic in the Q&A and discussion because there is very interesting corroborative, supportive data completely unrelated to Brulin Care's work with the 5128. Anyway, by way of a very specific example of what this means, Brulin Care estimated the remaining volume in front of an inserted earphone with both types of fixtures. In this case, the earphone was the Edemotic ER4. Inserted into a 711 simulator, there was around 575 cubic millimeters ahead of the inserted ear tip. But inserted into the 5128's ears, there was around 750 cubic millimeters ahead of the inserted ear tip. A receiver radiating into a small enclosure will generate a sound pressure inversely proportional to the volume of the space. So with the 711, there's less space, and so there's more pressure. And that's what we're seeing here. And the higher the acoustic output impedance, that is, the more closed the device under test is, the more something seals the canals, the more likely you are to see this. As you can see here, with an open back over ear headphone, in this case the Focal Clear, the bass levels on the 5128 are the same as with the 711. The other differences are interesting though, aren't they? Again, we can show more measurements during the Q&A and discussion. So it all depends on the particular headphone you're testing. Some open back over ear headphones show more bass differences. Some in-ear headphones have similar bass levels. Again, the only way to know for sure is to measure, but I feel confident whatever you're measuring, you're getting a more human-like response with the 5128 versus any previous standard. I'm out of time for this part of the session, so I want to end it with this quote from the late Edgar Shaw. It's a long quote, so let's focus on the bolded parts. It is useful to divide the acoustic antenna system into its functional components. The head, the torso, and the pinaflange acting as diffracting bodies, the concha and the ear canal serving as acoustic resonators, and the eardrum providing an acoustic termination. But these components must always be seen as parts of an integrated system. And that's what the Brulin Care 5128 provides. The 5128 is the average human in terms of hearing simulation, an integrated system. The 5128 pinna, canal, and eardrum are a cohesive unit, the simulation of average adult human hearing embodied within that system. You don't attach and detach canals and other miscellaneous bits and pieces to them. No matter what you're measuring on it, headset, handset, headphone, earphone, you're measuring that average human's response to all of them. And with that comes much greater realism accuracy, consistency. Thank you for watching.